to um, our Zoom gathering as a community. I know recently uh, just been a lot of things going on and in terms of COVID um, and also just the stress from the week of election and realize there's a lot of disconnection happening just with us having to be distant. And so I'm just super happy to be able to, to worship together um, in this space. And really, if you haven't been here before, this is really our like only type of um, communal and collective worship expression that we've been able to do recently. And I think in a lot of our push, um, especially this year with our reckoning with injustice and equality coming more to the surface, there's been a lot of, of, of push to keep fighting for those things. But we also recognize that the reason we do this is because God cares about justice and cares about that. And so us gathering together in these spaces is a way to remind us of, of what gives us that energy and the hope for a better world in the first place. And so really what to expect tonight is we're going to have some written prayers from people in our community. Um, we're going to have liturgy. If you don't know what that is, it's really um, just like a connected and, and collective way to share what we believe um, and to energize us um, to recognizing that that's, that's the reason why we move forward. And the liturgies tonight were written by, by Tara. Um, so those are from our, our community as well. And we're going to share a meditation and we'll also sing some songs. Um, and Bobby will lead us in those tonight. And so just before we get started, just to center our breath um, and just to get in the place of receiving and hearing, just want to invite Anton to lead us in a prayer to ground us. God of the body, renew and refresh our senses. Help us treat our breath as blessing. Help us treat our movement as miraculous. Help us treat our heartbeat as holy. God of the land, you put everything into motion. Help us treat everything as spiritual. Help us to resist destruction and overproduction. Help us take care of all that you have made. God of the neighborhood, you have made us in your image. Help us to feel our worth. Help us to see the dignity in others, even our enemies. Help us to acknowledge those that have walked the soil long before us. Amen. And so just as we move forward, the scripture that we'll be um, reflecting on and thinking about, um, we've been going through the Beatitudes just one by one. And today we're going over the second one um, from Matthew 5. And Jesus says this, uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And that's Matthew 5, 4. Natan, can you open us up with um, an approaching prayer? God of peace and comfort, our world today is marked by things that cause anxiety, things that cause depression, things that cause us to lose life, a global pandemic, unstable political systems, economic crisis, and more. In the midst of all of, of it all, we feel the pressure, the pressure to constantly project happiness, optimism, and productivity. We want to run away from what we feel. So please, God, meet us in this space. Teach us to rest. Help us slow down. Help us to embrace our pain. Help us to sit in our grief and let your peace be waiting on the other side. Amen. Amen. that's really good what stood out in that last little um, bit right there was just that phrase slow down first I was like but it already feels kind of slow right but I think there's a difference in like slowing down our minds as well versus just our physical bodies need to do to get in this space for worship you can close your eyes you can leave the screen that you're at and walk around the room that you're in you can stay on mute and just 
begin to sing your own song, whatever that is right now that you need. to keep thinking about that. Um, We'd love Tara to lead us in a liturgy. Um, And again, this is just a way for us to um, come together and really share in what we believe and share in what gives us energy and hope to move forward. And how it works is Tara is going to read a little bit and we uh, read together the bold pieces. And so it's kind of a a call and response and just another picture of us moving together. Um, but I think just for the sake of Zoom, stay muted. Um, encourage you to to speak out with it. But um, Anton is going to act on behalf of of the voice of of us, and Tara is going to lead us in this liturgy of justice. God of those who mourn, we pray with honest and open hearts, for there is no other way to pray. When one of us is hurting, we all hurt. When one of us is grieving, we all grieve. God of comfort who feels our pain and shares our tears. Our hearts ache as we consider our world. Amid our sorrow and pain, we know you hold us and love us. You hold us in confusion. You hold us in grief. You hold us in war and unrest. You hold us in disconnection. Father God, you do not celebrate our pain, but offer us protection. Mother God, you do not celebrate our pain, but offer us deep love. Compassionate God, you hold us. We acknowledge that you do not rush us through our pain. You are a God who made us for process. Like a gardener planting a seed and waiting for new life to emerge. 
you tend to our bodies, minds, and souls. You make a way for our growth. You make a way for our hope. You make a way for our restoration. You make a way for our mending. You make a way for us to love. You, good shepherd, make paths where none have ever been. Loving God, you sustain us. Just as you ache with those who mourn, equip us to mourn with each other. Help us to offer comfort and to care for our neighbors. Empower us. To love well. Empower us. To see others in their pain. Empower us. To celebrate our differences. Empower us. To believe in your goodness. Empower us. To be who you've called us to be. Compassionate God. Empower us to be a healing presence in our world. We need you. Amen. Tim, you're yeah. You know when you talk and it says like it reads that you're like your voice coming through and it says you are muted now. I'm like, <laughs> but I was just saying uh, thanks Tara for sharing that. Um, and I'm just like even before moving forward, I'm just glad that all of us in our community hold a piece to um, uh, just the things that give us life and it's not just one person and just so thankful that we get to uh, actually live that out but um, as we read earlier um, we are going through the Beatitudes and really we wanted to go through through these um, I think Dana brought it up originally but it was just a way for us to actually point back to the reason that we do pursue justice and pursue um, not just racially, but economically and socially and in every way. And really with a lot of voices and a lot of movement and a lot of organization, um, I think we're recognizing that our energy for, for doing this is because of the life and words and way of Jesus and how he pointed to and shows us the heart of God. And so this is just a way to point back to the very beginning of the narrative that it's not a new thing, but um, everything that we've, we've needed to move forward in our fight for justice and compassion and love is something that we already have. And it's just a way of, of seeing it and bring it to the surface. And so Anton, last time um, we talked about the Beatitudes, talked about the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit. But today we're talking about this idea um, and this thought that Jesus brings, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And I think even before going into that, I wanna talk a little about what it means to be blessed. Like, what does Jesus mean? What is he saying when he talks about blessed are those who mourn or blessed, is, blessed are anyone, you know, for, for all of these, what is Jesus actually saying? And Anton, last time he talked about this, talked about blessed being very ambiguous and it almost being slang in the first century for something like arise or get up or get moving or start walking. Like to be blessed is, is you're in a place where you can move and go. And a lot of the people that Jesus is talking about are people who, who didn't think that way, it's people on the fringes of society. And so this word blessed is you actually have the freedom to get moving. I was also reading too that, that blessed can also mean, again, it's slang, it's ambiguous, and it probably takes on different meanings for each of the Beatitudes, but it also means being in the right place. And so if I apply that even to what we're talking about today is blessed are those who mourn, it's awesome to hear it in that way of, of you're in the right place when you're mourning, when you're sad, when you're grieving, you're in right relationship and understanding with the world when you mourn. I think it's just cool to think about it that way because in that place, and then Jesus goes on because then you'll be comforted. And so just a cool way to start thinking about blessed and about this idea of mourning. But I want to talk about mourning a little bit and I think the way we understand mourning right now, probably in our world in America in 2020 is probably a lot different than the way Jesus and the people listening to him and the first century world understood mourning. And I think there's a lot to unpack just in this idea of grief and how different it is. But I think the main difference between Jesus's world and ours is 
our relationship with individualism versus collectivism. Like we're living in a very individual culture where Jesus was not. And public societal practices would have been something that was very familiar with Jesus. And it's something that we're still trying to fight to get familiar with and get used to because we're living in such an insular and individual type of culture where it's just me and my feelings and my sorrows and my grievings. And really Jesus is probably talking about something a little more than that. And I think just for more talk on individual and collective too, Tara and Dana just did a podcast on it, on our podcast, and they have a really great conversation on collective culture if, if you wanna hear more about it. But even going back into mourning, I think the reason that Jesus and the first century world and the people that he was talking to are so familiar with it was because their ancestors were really familiar with it. It goes back to even before their time, it, his ancestors saw the world this way. And if Jesus was Jewish, it meant that his worldview and his way of thinking about the world was informed by the prophets who came before him. It was informed by those of old. And it's really the prophets of the Old Testament, um, Jesus's ancestors, who started talking about mourning and lament and grief as a holistic and spiritual discipline. And so they're seeing mourning as this collective spiritual discipline and want to bring up some verses to talk about that. And so is mourning personal or public? Well, let's see what the prophets got to say about it. Well, they say, look and see our disgrace and lamentations. In the Psalms, they sing, we sat as exiles, mourning our captivity. Our music was no longer heard, only sadness. Jeremiah was a prophet and says, put on sackcloth. Again, this is like a ritual of mourning. He says, my people and roll with ashes, mourn with bitter wailing. And so there's this collective understanding of sadness. And while our individual mourning is tied into that, it was actually a together type of thing. And so we ask why, like why all this mourning, why all this sadness, why all this grief? And I think we got to look at Jeremiah again, because the reason they were mourning, I think even in all of these verses was because they as a society were going into exile. And that means a lot, but exile just means you're losing your culture, you're losing your society, you're losing everything you ever knew because it's not working anymore. And something better or bigger or stronger was coming along. And so that's the reason they're all mourning. But I think it, it would be cool to look into to Jeremiah because Jeremiah gives us insight into why they are losing their culture in the first place. And in Jeremiah 6, speaking on behalf of God, God says the city must be punished or must be exiled because it's filled with oppression. He also says that from the least to the greatest, all the greedy want is gain. Even the prophets and priests practice deceit. And so why all this mourning? It's because they're living in a society that's filled with oppression. They're living in a culture where not just the, the top, but also the bottom are greedy. They're living in a culture where the prophets and the priests, the people who are controlling the systems and the structures that you live in, they are actually practicing deceit. And so they're creating structures and systems to oppress people. Verse 14, they dress the wounds of the suffering as if it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. So they're looking at real suffering and downplaying it, gaslighting, essentially, the suffering of the most vulnerable. And so why all this mourning? It's because Jeremiah is living in a society that is filled with oppression. So essentially, the world that God promised and the world that God wants God's people to fight for is far from a reality from the world that the, the Israelites were actually creating. And this led to exile and it led to mourning. And so, yes, blessed are those who mourn. It's not the mourning of personal loss or grief or individual sorrow. It's about realizing how far our society is from the kingdom that God promises. Put here, grief is seeing how far we are from the, from the kingdom that God invites us to. It's sorrow over the distance between the just and generous world we are called to and the systems of injustice and destruction that actually exists in, in everything we do. 
And so that's the cause for mourning. And if we speed back up, like we were looking at Jeremiah and the prophets, if we fast forward to when Jesus is talking, it's the same kind of world. There was a disconnect between the life that Jesus offered, the abundant life and kingdom that Jesus gave and talked about, and the life that Rome gave, the life that the religious elite gave. It, it existed in Jeremiah's day and it exists in Jesus's day. And this is what's happening in Jesus's world, right? There's vast societal inequalities, rich and poor, tensions between the rich and poor. There's violent displays of power and control from the empire. There's a destructive infrastructure that only protects a few people and leaves everyone else vulnerable to, to disease and malnutrition and instability and overworking. And so all of these oppressive structures that we read about that existed when Jeremiah was a prophet are still happening in Jesus's world. And so when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he's speaking to the grievings of the people who are most affected by these oppressive systems. And as a community, we, we've been reading a lot, um, just this book, it's called Sabbath as Resistance. And it's this idea that we're living in a culture that is, is all about productivity um, and consumption. And really Sabbath or, or resting is a way to resist that, to say that we can actually be defined by covenant relationship and love and generosity rather than overworking. And I think when, when I read Blessed Are Those Who Mourn and understanding the kind of world that Jesus is living in, it's also not just Sabbath as resistance, but sadness as resistance too. Sadness can be an act of resistance to the world that we're living in. It's a refusal to the way things are, and it's a resistance to the systems and powers that want to keep it that way. And I think in our world, there's lots of like depression and sadness right now. And a lot of times I just hear people talk about how like, well, well, really the young generation just needs to, to, to get better and realize how tough life is, like, because that's what we did, you know? And so there's this kind of push against all of the, the depression and, and anxiety that's springing up to the surface. But I think what's really happening is the weight of our society is actually starting to get to us. And, and really in our sadness, we're saying that we don't want to take it anymore. Um, it's getting to a point where it's getting harder and harder for us to just let it happen. And we're looking at the, sim the symptoms of, of oppressive structures and tiring, anxiety-inducing structures. And in, instead of looking at the symptoms, we're, we're, we're not giving depression and, and grief its rightful voice. And I think what, what Jesus is inviting us into, and blessed are those who grieve, is can we give depression and grief its rightful voice? Because when we give depression and grief and sadness and mourning its rightful voice, it opens up the door for a new and better way. And that new and better way is what Jesus finishes the story with. And I love that Jesus doesn't just leave us on blessed are those who mourn, but he also says they will be comforted. I think, um, oh, cool. Want to bring up this quote. <laughs> just talking about uh, despair and, and sorrow, kind of having a rightful voice. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a follower of Jesus in the shadow of the German empire about 70 years ago, 80 years ago. And he said this, he says, by morning, speaking about this beatitude, Jesus means doing without what the empire calls peace, productivity, and prosperity. He means refusing to accommodate to its standard of life. We are people who mourn for the world, for its guilt, for its fate. And while the empire sings, gather your rosebuds while you may, or enjoy life while you can, we instead mourn. We see that for all of the jollity and optimism on board, the ship is beginning to sink. And so that's really our sadness as resistance in work. It's, it's paying attention to the fact that, that things are actually not going in the way that the kingdom of heaven is supposed to go. And so the, the, the end of the story though that Jesus gives us is we will be comforted. And I think just as our mourning isn't a private individual expression, but it's a societal and public experience, I think the comfort is that comfort isn't just an individual feel good thing either. It's also a public and collective experience. 
It means undoing all of these broken systems that keep the poor poor, that keep the oppressed oppressed, that keep the sad sad. And it's saying we want a better way. We want a new way. Um, and just to touch on this too, um, Walter Brueggemann says, those who do not mourn will not be comforted and those who do not face the endings will not receive the beginnings. Those who have not cared enough to grieve will not know joy. And so I just think if there's any of us with the disconnection that's going on with um, all of the, the, the bad news and the instability, um, I just think there's hope because I think it's only in this spot of, of feeling disconnected and depressed and grieving and sadness that joy comes on the other side. Um, and just wanna close with another word from, from the prophets, from the Psalms. And the psalmist says, those who sow in tears will reap in joy. Um, and I really think it's cool to think of, of it that way, almost like an investment. And I love that the tears aren't something that, that are happening. It's actually something that, that's intentionally pursued. It's sowing the tears, right? It's not just things are happening to me, so I'm, I'm crying. It's no, I'm, I'm choosing to embrace and run after the grief because I know when I do so, I will reap joy. So just asking that question is what are we choosing to invest in tonight? Um, what are we, we choosing to say yes to and say no to? What are we choosing to run towards and run away from? Um, and is it grief or is it this false sense of um, productivity and opportunity? And so just if you're feeling mourning, there's comfort. Um, and if not, there's an invitation to, to seek out a new and better way. And so Tara, if you wanna lead us as we talk through discipleship. Our ever-present God, we recognize that you are God of this moment. We do not need to wait for you to show up. You have always been here with us. God who is close, we are real, realizing that you are closer than we think. You are not hovering over us in ambiguous ways. You are not intangible. You dwell in each of us. God of comfort, comfort is found in the expression of your love through my neighbor, through my friend, through my family, through creation, through shared meals. So we come together that we might walk together, that we might live together. Oh God, make your home among us. In disconnection. You are the God who links us. In isolation. You are the God who gathers us. In confusion. You are the God that stills us. God who holds us together. May we know not just in our minds, but rather deeply know in our hearts that you are here with us now in this moment and in every moment to come. Amen. When I'm feeling low And my heart is weak I know you have We're all broken down And we're filled with grief I know you're far beyond What my mind can see is I know
I can feel your heart through the pain and strife. And as I look beyond the cares of life, I can feel your heart. Yeah, I feel you wash my side. God of relentless hope, God of new beginnings, you remind us that to mourn is to be open to a new day. To grieve is to long for your comfort. To despair is to resist our current reality. Energize us in our pursuit of your kingdom. Show us that comfort is more than just an inner feeling. Comfort is the announcement and realization of heaven on earth. You do not leave us alone, Lord. You do not abandon us in our grief. You see us and hold us and move us towards relentless hope, towards new beginnings. Amen. Amen, y'all. Love it. Thanks for coming. And 